I'm Jay Xu, director of the Asian Art Museum. But before I greet you, I would like to invite Jack Wadsworth, founder of the Asian Contemporary Art Consortium, to address us. Jack. Thank you, Jay. This is a night that we've been dreaming about for a long time. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be here representing the Asian Contemporary Arts Consortium. Uh, I am a co-chair. There are two other co-chairs, Jay Shu and Stephen Beal. And this is, in fact, a joint venture between the museum, uh, the California College of the Arts, and the Asia Society here in San Francisco. Um, I, I just can't um, tell you how pleased I am that, number one, the room is full and that we have really begun uh, this week to launch the first Asian Contemporary Art Week in San Francisco. So I'm proud to say that after many years of planning and thinking about this idea, this is the end of the beginning. Um, <laughs> the idea of uh, having Holland Cotter here, uh, an evening with Holland Cotter, is just really special. And uh, I just want to thank Holland right now for coming out for this event. Thank you. So briefly, um, why promote contemporary Asian art? Um, it's something that Susie, my wife, and I have had on our minds for a long time. Um, I'm sure many of you know that we, after 25 years in New York, spent five years in Tokyo and 10 in Hong Kong, and developed a fascination for understanding the culture of Asia through its art. And I am moved to remember that the whole idea of the Asia Society, uh, which was the idea of John D. Rockefeller III, uh, was very simply stated in 1956, if you can believe, Asia will be important in this century, and in order to understand Asia, you will have to understand its culture, uh, hence the founding of the Asia Society. Um, we care because we think that the understanding uh, that will be necessary to lead us through the 21st century um, in a partnership way with Asia as opposed to in competition uh, will be very much based on understanding each other's culture. So if we can make a tiny difference, uh, that will be quite satisfying. Um, we actually thought about this idea going back to New York City um, in November of 2002, and that was the first Asian Art Week in New York City. Uh, it never would have occurred to us then uh, that, would be, that we would be just as passionate about the idea of creating this same format in San Francisco. But when we moved here 10 years ago, one of the things that was immediately apparent was that while there was a huge interest uh, among all of the citizens of the Bay Area in, car, in, in art and culture, that there was a real lacking uh, in the understanding and the importance of Asian contemporary art, even though the city of San Francisco is populated by about 41% Asian Americans. Um, I think we are about the task of making a difference. Uh, one of the things that got us going about a year ago was the engagement with uh, a brilliant young woman named Xiao Yu Wang. Xiao Yu Wang is the director of the Asian Contemporary Arts Consortium. It's much simpler for me to say ACK, ACK, SF. Xiao Yu, um, Stand up and just wave your hand so people can applaud. <laughs> Xiao Yu, of course, is a product of the mainland. She's a product of the Central Academy in Beijing. 
but most importantly, she is now a product of the California College of the Arts, um, which as our partner in this um, endeavor uh, uh, is, is the home that she works out of. Um, finally, let me just recall, because it's uh, on my mind tonight, we had a dinner, I was talking to Stephen Beale earlier, uh, in September of 2008, and uh, that was the night that this idea really uh, got legs. And um, uh, I would say two things. One, I think Jay Shu had been in San Francisco maybe 15 minutes. <laughs> we grabbed him, uh, we got him to come to dinner, and enlisted his support and this movement would never have occurred without the leadership of Jay Shu in the contemporary Asian arts field. Um, let me just recall for everybody that at that dinner were Susie and me, Stephen Beale, Vishaka Desai, Dipti Matur, Bruce Pickering, Britta Erickson, and Larry Rinder. That was the founding core group. And as we signed the menu that night, my note to myself and on the menu said, and the dinner was, by the way, at the Pacific Union Club, I wonder how many contemporary movements started at the PU Club. <laughs> if this is the first, then we can be proud of that too. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Jay who will introduce the panel. And let me just say, as uh, friends, as travelers in China, as believers in this movement, we couldn't be more fortunate than we are to have Jay Xu as the leader of this museum and the leader of this discussion tonight about the contemporary Asian art uh, critical writing question. Jay. Thank you, Jack. Uh, is my mic on? Believe everything he said, except the last sentence. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Jack is truly a leader in many ways, and in this particular case, the Asian Contemporary Art Consortium. And uh, tonight, you know, the program was developed in partnership with ACAC and also Art Practical. This is a unique and exciting partnership between our three organizations to help build the audience and promote sustainable interest around the Asian contemporary art. And I'd like to add, this is a signature event of the inaugural Asian Contemporary Art Week in San Francisco. So before I give you our featured speaker, Harlan Carter, I would like to particularly single out a few individuals without whose effort we would not have been here this evening. First of all, of course, Xiao Yu. And also I like to oh. And also I'd like to particularly thank my co-chair, Jack Wardworth and Stephen Bill, and all the co-hosts at that original dinner at the PU Club. And also I'd like to acknowledge our partner Patricia Maloney, Director of Art Practical. Patricia, could you please stand up to be recognized? Yeah. yeah. And uh, as many of us know, Art Practical is an online magazine promoting the Bay Area's role in the international art scene that enriches critical dialogue for the visual arts by providing comprehensive analysis of events and exhibits. And now also, it's my distinct pleasure to announce on behalf of all the partners that put this e event together, Ellen Tani, who is the recipient of the inaugural Asian Contemporary Art Consortium Writing Fellowship. Ellen, are you with us? Please, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. And uh, it is fitting to announce Ellen's Writing Fellowship at this discussion featuring none other than Harlan Carter, of course. And I hope our Phantom Show have a lot for you to write about. <laughs> so, um, as you know, tonight's program kicks off the Phantoms of Asia, Contemporary Art Awakens the Past, opening activities. 
As we know, this is the largest, most ambitious contemporary art exhibition in the history of our museum. 31 artists from 15 nations, 60 works altogether. But as this exhibition, as much about contemporary art, it is about traditional art. It was interspersed with all every part of our museum, not only in the first floor special exhibition gallery, but also on the second and the third floor collection gallery. And this is my fundamental belief. When art was made, it was always contemporary. We can always use each perspective to look at other, from historic perspective, looking at contemporary art, and using today's perspective <coughs> to draw new understanding and appreciation of traditional art. And also, at this point, I'd like to also recognize the curators for the exhibition, Mami Kataoka. <laughs> Mami's regular job is the chief curator at the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, a cutting edge museum. And, but we stole, we stole her for several periods of time so that she could come here to help us to put this exhibition together. The exhibition is really her brainchild. We went out to solicit many proposals from diverse group of curators, and hers won the day. So that's why we're here today. But also, I'd like to single out our own assistant curator of contemporary art, Alison Hardy. <laughs> Mami, working on this project in collaboration with Alison, along with many other curators, uh, in our museum. In a way, this exhibition really changed the curatorial practice in our museum, but for the first time, because all the curators, no matter what your <coughs> discipline is, worked together to create a show under the leadership of Mami. So that is truly wonderful. And also, the heroes among us, in addition to the curators, are the artists. So may I ask all the artists present to stand up to be recognized? Some have left for other projects, but I'm sure their spirit are with us. So finally, let me spend a few minutes to introduce our featured speaker, Harlan Carter. Harlan is a co-chief art critic at the New York Times. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for criticism in 2009. In 2010, he was given the Lifetime Achievement Award for art writing by the College Art Association. He was, for many years, a contributor editor at the Art in America magazine and also an editorial associate at the Art News. He received an A.B. from Harvard College, where he studied poetry with Robert Lowell, also a Master of Arts degree in Art History from City University, where he worked with Rosalind Frost, and a Master of Philosophy from Columbia University, where he worked with the Vidya Dehaja, and also focused on early Indian Buddhist art. Holland has been a tremendous writer that we know, and he is publishing a selection of his past writings. Right now, he also enjoys an honorary degree of Doctor of Human Letters from the Maryland Institute of College of Arts. He is a 2012 Pointer Fellow in Journalism at Yale University. As I mentioned, Besides all the other projects, for example, his latest writing on African art in Africa, contemporary art, he's also publishing a selection of his previous writing. I cannot wait to read that. So without further ado, let me give you Colin Carter. Thank you. Thank you. I can't re uh, wait to read that book either. <laughs> Finding a time. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. I think this is better. Uh, first, let me say how happy I am to be here at the Asian Art Museum. My first visits were back in the 1960s when the museum was in Golden Gate Park. And I have vivid memories of visiting here when this uh, building was first used as the museum. When it moved in, I think it was nine years ago, I came for the uh, inaugural uh, session here. I'm also thrilled to be in town to celebrate both the inaugural edition of the San Francisco Asian Art Contemporary Week and the opening of Phantoms of Asia, Contemporary Awakens the Past, 
uh, here at the museum. Uh, it's a genius idea, I think, for to combine old art and, and contemporary art. And I'm hoping that the Metropolitan Museum, which will soon have the Whitney's Old Building, will be listening, will be coming here to see this show and listening to the idea behind it and combining these two elements in its, in its collections. Uh, I'd like to offer just a quick uh, anecdotal backstory about my own relationship to Asian art. And of course, I use the term Asian art um, as a convenient shorthand for uh, many very different cultures <clears throat> that coexist on that vast uh, piece of turf we call Asia. I was introduced to a few of those cultures in childhood. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, in a museum-going family. Our main museum was the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which has a fabulously uh, famous collection of Japanese art, as well as superb Chinese and South Asian holdings. When I was a kid, my mother was a, a low-key, antique shop level uh, collector of uh, China trade porcelain. And Bostonians of an older generation at that time, and this was in the 1950s, still knew about the Boston Buddhists, these New England gents who went to Japan in the 19th century, fell in love with Japanese culture and Japanese art. And uh, because a lot was, uh, there was a lot of tr political turmoil in Japan at the time, a lot of uh, Buddhist art was up for grabs, and these guys grabbed it and brought it back to Boston. So we still have it t today. Uh, art museums in the 1950s, uh, which is when I started going, were not like museums today. This was before the blockbusters were invented. Uh, museums were drab, quiet places with lots of wood frame glass cases, gray walls, and very little foot traffic. Nothing in them ever seemed to change, and the art seemed to be frozen in time. On Saturdays in the winter, my parents would drop me off at the MFA while they went shopping and leave me there for hours to wander around by myself. <laughs> the guards all knew me, and because I was this kind of uh, wonkish, bookish kid, uh, but, but pretty together, um, they let me be. They didn't, they didn't bother me at all. They were like babysitters. <laughs> so I got to know that museum and its collection very well very early. Uh, Copley portraits, Monet landscapes, uh, Netherlandish saints, and Hindu divinities were all in the mix for me. And of course, they had a great uh, Indian collection that was put together largely by Ananda Kumar Swami. I was particularly drawn to Asian material, I think, because of the atmosphere of composure that I associated with it. Um, by comparison, European art, even then, seemed to me uh, to be busy and nervous and never stopped talking. I kept going back to the galleries, galleries with large-scale Japanese Buddhist uh, temple figures. I was practically the only one who ever went there. I would sit in the gallery, which was quite dim in those dark Boston winter afternoons, and read or daydream and feel very protected and included and at home. So that was the primal scene, art-wise, for me. I must say, uh, and I've realized this only over time, that equally important uh, to that Asian art experience was the experience of being exposed to the entire museum there. Uh, by osmosis, I was getting a sense of the interconnection and equivalence in value of all kinds of different cultures across the globe and across the centuries. Because of that immersion, I think, no art has ever felt foreign to me, which doesn't mean that a lot of it hasn't felt mysterious and surprising. There are certainly were surprises ahead, and we're seeing some of them in museums today. I'd like to just quote something from a 1982 guide to the MFA's collection of Asiatic art uh, written by the director at that time. Uh, this is 1982. In spite of unmistakable signs that the collection will continue to grow, it is unlikely that it will change radically from its present form and scope. After generations of trustees and curators who saw the expansion of the collection as their primary goal, we have now entered a phase in the Asiatic department's history in which the emphasis will shift to conservation, exhibition, and research. Of course, what no one or very few people could have foreseen 30 years ago was the huge and I would say revolutionary surge in the collecting and exhibiting of contemporary art by museums, a phenomenon that uh, Vishaka Desai and Jay and I will be discussing in the conversation that follows. 
This phenomenon has, in fact, radically changed the form and scope of institutions and their collections, arguably both for the better and for the worse. Questions of for better or for worse naturally bring me to the subject of art criticism, and I'm thrilled to bits to be here this evening and we're to acknowledge uh, and rejoice in the presence of a new generation of San Francisco art writers, many of whom have a particular interest in and knowledge of Asian contemporary art and Asian American art. Such a celebration is no small thing. In my experience, critics are rarely, as a species, fully appreciated by the world at large, and never get properly celebrated, except when they celebrate themselves. <laughs> and we do celebrate ourselves, in the short commercial break here, <laughs> when the International Association, of art, International Association of Art Critics, known as ICA, meets at various places around the world. I urge any critic here who isn't a member of ICA to join up. Dues are cheap, your membership card gets you free admission to all kinds of museums and events, and despite what you may hear, your fellow critics are a nice bunch of people. <laughs> Some of us are a nice bunch of people. <laughs> Apropos of art critics and criticism, I'd like to read you an email I received this past weekend. I regularly get letters of this kind. I won't identify the sender uh, by name, though I did ask permission to quote him, and he said fine. Dear Mr. Cotter, I am a student at the University College of London studying for a BA in the history of art. I have a psychology graduate degree from the University of the Philippines. I'm writing this letter to express my interest in learning art criticism from you. Since I completed my first degree in 2009, I've been doing internships in various facets of the art industry. I've worked as an assistant to a conservator restorer, a volunteer to a private museum, and a part-time intern for a university-based modern art museum. Also, I have been working remotely for, as an intern for an Oslo-based gallery in preparation for the Hong Kong International Art Fair, which opens this week. Since I realized my passion for art a few years back when I was stuck in the psychology lab, I started reading reviews from the New York Times, The New Yorker, and some free articles from the Boston Globe. I first stumbled upon your reviews when I was reading a weekend issue of the local paper, which has a supplement for The New York Times. It was the first art review to engage me in a conversation with the writer. I love this. Um, I, did, I did not remember your name. I love that, too. And it took me another year to figure it out. Your archived article on Islamic art titled Beauty in the Shadow of Violence, uh, which I wrote a few months after 9-11, to kind of just f flip the emphasis around to understanding rather than mourning and so forth. <clears throat> A Beauty in the Shadow of Violence, <clears throat> excuse me, was the link that reconnected me to your reviews. I read it in preparation for the essay I submitted for my University College of London application. The article was personal, too, since I grew up on a war-torn war island south of the Philippines, an area with a significant Muslim population. To return to the initial purpose of this letter, I would like to propose a mentorship program with you that would expand my understanding of a form of art criticism that does not intimidate, but invites every reader to the discussion. The current state of criticism in this country, I, I assume he means the Philippines, aside from almost not existing, is confused on how to react to and deal with pressures from academia, the art market, and the public. The influx of information from the internet also adds to the convolut convoluted system of criticism. Aside from personal reasons, this frustration is another potent motivation for my desire to learn more. I think you really nailed it as far as d defining the four things that critics are faced with today, to, de to reconciling themselves to and to uh, cr doing crossover uh, work with academia, the art market, the public, and, and the internet. I periodically get similar letters so there are a lot of us out there, as well as in here, a lot of critics, trying to figure out how to do this job, how to keep doing it since the terrain is changing so much. I don't think there are any firm answers, but then I'm not sure we want to settle on firm answers, because we need to keep lots of options open for criticism, just as we do for art. Context can make a big difference. 
A year or so ago, I hosted a visit to the Times by a group of young Russian art critics visiting New York. I took them through the building, introduced them around, and then, with a translator, we all sat down at a table to talk. And one of the questions I was asked was, who do you envision yourself writing for? What audience do you think you are responsible to? My reply was, as a writer for a general interest newspaper, my first responsibility is to my readers. And what I owe my readers before anything else is a reading experience, using straightforward language, plain American which cats and dogs can understand, to quote Marianne Moore, that conveys some sense of an art, of an art experience that I have had and that they may want to share. My guests looked a little uncertain about this, so I turned the question around to them. To whom did they, as art critics, feel responsible? They said, to galleries and artists. Then it came out that they all lived not in Moscow, but in smaller cities, where the gallery infrastructure was tentative and artists were struggling and needed all the moral support from critics that they could get. So again, the context for criticism can shape how you see its uses and its responsibilities. There are, many, there are many possible ways to proceed, many possible forms to explore. I'm organizing a panel called Art Criticism Taking the Pulse at the 2013 meeting of the College Art Association, which is in New York City next February. And I'm hoping that some sense of the range of options available to critical writing will come out in that session. Art Practical, the online journal based here in San Francisco, already offers an excellent paradigm for criticism's digital possibilities. Finally, if I were to give three pieces of advice to young critics right now, and obviously I'm addressing most of my remarks to critics, so I care about them deeply, um, I might say that I, I would give the following. Uh, they're very basic, they're very simple. First, whatever your subject is, bring some passion to it. Passion does not preclude objectivity, but it can do miracles for language, and language is crucial. It's the soul of the craft. It's the art part of writing. It's the art part of art writing. Personally, when I'm stuck, I, I, I can't shake an idea loose. I go to other writers um, to, to try and get my machine going again. And I reach for uh, Gertrude Stein, frequently. I pull, you know, <laughs> tender buttons off the shelf, and you read that, and the language is so fresh and so uh, new sounding that it just freshens you up. And, uh, Emily Dickinson is another person I, who I read since I was, I was reading Emily Dickinson in the MFA when I was a kid. That's what it was, one of the poets I was reading. I still read her for the same reason, because it's a language-intensive style of writing. So bring, bring, bring passion to the subject always. Second, keep in mind that while you are shaping art history with your writing, a larger history is always shaping you. We are products of our time and of our society, including the society called the art world which includes the art market. I personally feel most comfortable operating at some distance from the art world. At the same time, there is another shaping history, of which I've become increasingly aware as I've grown older, and that is personal history. The older I get, <clears throat> the older I get, the more clearly I see that all my writing comes out of my past, going back to those winter afternoons with the Japanese Buddhas in Boston, continuing through the liberations of the 1960s in a country that is in a state of perpetual war, through the AIDS epidemic, through the rise of multiculturalism, through the time spent in India, China, and most recently in Africa, through 9-11 and into the present. All of this, all of these events, all of these eras have shaped what I choose to write about and how I write about it. Maybe not every time out, but cumulatively. And as a third and last piece of advice, I would offer a single word, <clears throat> generosity. This does not mean refraining from saying negative things. I just mean that generosity is the place to come from. Everything starts with hands open and a readiness to embrace. What happens after that is what happens after that. But it should be arms open to the future always. Phantoms of Asia signals a new way into the future for the Asian Art Museum and potentially as a model for other museums. The young critics here tonight are the future of the craft that I hold dear. Love you. Thank you.